So Jeff, as I said, is going to be um, talking uh, about the last of the Nature Matters programs, uh, the scoop on the SCAT. And with that, I'm going to let you take over, Jeff, and I'm going to mute myself and turn off my video. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Boyd. So uh, after this introduction, I'll be turning my video off as well. It's a little bit distracting while, while I'm presenting, but uh, thanks, Boyd. Thanks, Floyd, as always. I appreciate your help. And um, welcome, Lisa. Uh, be nice to meet you in person, hopefully. I, I have to say, I, I am sad to see this ending for this season. They, they've been a real treat for, for me and I think for the Park Service and for the park as well, given the, the challenges we've had in other areas this, this season. Not being able to meet uh, visitors in person has been a, a real drawback for me personally. So. I am looking forward to starting them again in the spring and I'll send that list over to Boyd and um, the <laughs> kind of a teaser, the, one of the first ones we want to do is um, the secret lives of trees, talking about trees and how they um, actually communicate with one another and speak to one another. So it's rather a fascinating topic. Um, well, <laughs> There are some topics that are just a bit uncomfortable to talk about, and this is one, one of those. Uh, the scoop on scat, the prominence and importance of poop in the park, or as I like to, uh, to call it, uh, who pooped in the park. So with that, I'm going to turn on my video and, and we'll jump right in. Do any of these look familiar? Well, if any of those did look familiar, we have a serious problem in the islands. I don't think we have any grizzly bears here. No bison, although there, uh, there have been uh, fossilized bison found, I think on Orcas and elk were certainly here. Uh, all those have been hunted away, but um, although grizzly elk and bison were, were likely in the islands in prehistoric times, they're no longer here, of course, but their poo does remain in the form of, of rich soil and, of course, fossils from time, from, from time to time. We'll talk about those that are called corporophiles. Uh, wherever it is, and no matter who left it, it comes in a variety of names, and we know what some of those names are. Poop. Crap, dung, do, discharge, stool, or scat. Scat's a strange word, and I, I wondered where it comes from, so I, I looked it up. There's lots of speculation I, I learned about the origin of it. So I'm going to go with the Random House version, which says it perhaps comes from uh, the English dialectical meaning to scatter, fling, or to bespatter. It's not a great visual image uh, for sure, but probably appropriate. So let's talk first about how poop gets made. Every species on the planet consumes food of some kind and excretes waste. Because digestion uh, of any energy source is never 100% efficient, waste or byproduct is created and either stored, reconsumed, or deposited as waste. No matter what we call it, that's all scat. Uh, there are nine interesting facts about poo that, that I'd like to share with you. And, um, oops, sorry about that. Uh, I won't get into the detail about uh, the whys of these. Instead, I'll leave you with um, some after class homework to investigate, but I found these rather fascinating. You can find the, the details of these at the, um, the URL that I'm going to pop up in just a moment. But poo is mostly bacteria uh, that was living in your gut. So I thought it was leftover food. It is not. There is some of that in there, but it's primarily bacteria. Poo is brown because of dead red blood cells and bile. Men and women poo differently. Essentially, it's more difficult for women to poo for a variety of reasons. The ideal poop is continuous log that sinks. Gut bacteria and fiber are essential for good poo. You can see corn in your poo because of cellulose. Did not know that. People in different parts of the world have different kinds of poo. Uh, and if we're parents, we 
didn't already know this, baby poop is really, really weird. So here's that URL. I'll give you just a second to copy it down. It's a, it's a fascinating article about uh, how poo difference differs um, uh, between species, between men and women around the globe, and, and what uh, really makes it up. And I'll pass that up uh, back at the end of the presentation as well. So there are four stages of digestion that apply to every species on the planet, though the precise mechanism for any given species will be different. Uh, egestion or pooping is an absolute requirement for every species. Um, no excretion means certain death as internal organs are not equipped to treat and store waste for very long periods of time. In humans, as with all animals, Storing waste for too long is very uncomfortable and it's dangerous as well. And of course, we all know that uh, GlaxoSmithKline has made a great deal of money from this simple fact with a product called Xlax. So what are the benefits of, to the environment of poo? Every plant on the planet needs three things in order to grow, sunlight, water, nutrients. Uh, most plants get those nutrients from the soil, some from water and all from the air. The process is, is pretty basic. A seed plant uses sunlight to synthesize foods from carbon dioxide and water. Photosynthesis in plants generally involves the green pigment chlorophyll and uh, they themselves generate the most important scat on the planet, oxygen as a byproduct. Without oxygen, there would be very little life as we know it on the planet. So you can think of oxygen as a form of waste or poo. But because we humans consume so many plants as part of our diet, we have to intensely farm the land. This means that we have to put back nutrients into the soil that the plants consume as they grow because we don't give the land enough time to generate enough new nutrient content to, to grow new plants. So we augment the soils with fertilizers. Fertilizers can come as natural as seen here or synthetic, but in either case, we're trying to get nutrients to the plants we grow to begin the scat cycle that we all depend upon. So in order to maintain the soil to poop cycle, we cheat a little bit. We collect nutrients such as poop from farm animals, the same ones who consumed much of that plant life to begin with, uh, and we give it back to them uh, in the form of plants for, for them to digest and create more poo. It, it's truly a strange cycle, but one that's completely natural if accelerated at least a little bit. Some plants do with this intense cycle, but some don't. Uh, as for most animals and humans, none of us seem to care much. So what is not natural is that because the animals we, we feed extract so many nutrients in their own digestive process, and because we're in such a hurry, we have to add non-natural nutrients to help these things along. Good or bad, it's all part of the natural cycle that we've created and manipulate for human purposes. In any event, the cycle of creating food, burning food for energy and depositing waste continues that it has since the origins of time on our planet. The components that soil needs in order for, to grow food upon which we all depend are fairly basic, whether uh, you're a meat eater or not, you, you still need these things, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Nitrogen used in growth and photosynthesis is a common element um, in the universe, estimated at about one seventh of the total abundance in the solar system. The human body contains about 3% nitrogen by mass, and it's the fourth most abundant element in the body after oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. Phosphorus helps plant convert nutrients for growth. It's the second most plentiful mineral in the body, the first being calcium. Your body needs phosphorus for many functions such as filtering waste and repairing tissues and cells. Most people get the amount of phosphorus they need uh, in the simple daily diet, don't need additives. And finally, potassium. 
used in both growth and reproduction. It's one of the seven essential macro minerals. The human body requires about 100 milligrams of potassium daily to support key processes. Um, a high potassium intake reduces the risk of overall mortality by 20% and decreases the risk of stroke, lowers blood pressure, protects against loss of muscle mass, etc. So these primary poop components are incredibly important to human beings, but also every other animal on the planet. Every one of those nutrients, nutrient, nutrients excuse me, is, is contained in poop for a good reason. We, like every other animal on the planet, are what we eat. And because animals eat other plants and other animals, our poop contains most of the nutrients we need um, to have a complete diet. I say most of the vitamins we need because there is one vitamin that we can't get enough of from our food. What is that vitamin? Vitamin D, the common denominator without which most life on the planet simply can't exist. It's required to grow plants and sustain most life on the planet. Photosynthesis from the sun is the ignition switch that starts the entire poo cycle and the engine upon which most life on the planet uh, depends, and the most important component for the creation of poop. And like the sun, everything on the planet depends on plant life. Even pure carnivores can't exist without plants. Why? Because the animals that are consumed by the carnivore eat plants. And the plants love poop because it's so dense in nutrients. Plants with access to fresh poop are very happy plants indeed. And animals that depend on plant life leave that plant life everywhere. So poo is not only a source of nutrient, it's also a plant distribution mechanism. Uh, for the record, the African savanna elephant holds the prize for the largest living terrestrial animal and has the record for the longest distance mover of seeds via poo. Um, an elephant can transport seeds up to 65 kilometers away. Exhibit A. I'm glad that was not a, an elephant poo splatter, by the way. The cycle is natural and never ending, and the participants in the cycle include plants, animals, and you and I, and something called coprophiles. It's not only animals which love poop. Copros, phyla, fondness for excrement. Coprophiles such as mushrooms can grow in just plain old soil, but they're really happy when they find poop in the park. But it's not just a one-way relationship. In the process of consuming poop as an energy source, mushrooms also help to break down the poop, which will then leach back into the surrounding soil and provide feeding for other plant life near and far. Yes, it's natural for animals other than your dog or cat to eat poop, theirs and others. Coprophagia is that excrement eating proclivity. Rabbits are particularly noted to eat their poop and poop of those around them. So why? I wondered why. I see particularly rabbits doing this, but dogs and cats as well. It's because some animals have digestive tracts that are very efficient. In some cases, they eat faster than their digestive tracts can convert the food to energy. So nutrients remain in the poop. And so eating poop is not only an efficient recycling, uh, in environments where food is scarce, it's the difference between life and death for some animals. But sometimes I wonder if they don't just like the way it tastes. Did you know that dogs line themselves up with the Earth's magnetic field when they urinate and defecate? I find that fascinating. If at first you don't succeed, eat your poop. Do you recognize this little guy? That's right, the dung beetle. Proof that saving for a rainy day applies to poop as well. 
Fun fact, dung beetles navigate at night by following the Milky Way. I, and uh, as a ranger and a grant writer for the park, I'd love to know how the, the person got the grant money to figure that out. I'd also like to understand how they, how they figured that out. Here's another fun fact, hibernating bears don't poop or pee. They can hold it for up to four months. I don't know about you, but my kids couldn't even hold it to the next exit. And what we see when bears and other hibernators finally do poop once they wake up is that the food has been highly digested. In short, there isn't much left to make poop. So what are the benefits to humankind other than the basics of providing fertilizer? The Sioux called buffalo bison scat, nick nick. And they also used nick nick as another term to describe broken promises by the US government. I think I understand that translation pretty well after that. We use a similar term today, by the way. But Nick Nick has been used by the Sioux just as it does other civilizations across the globe, even today. Remember what buffalo eat, right? Grass and other plants. And when those plants are consumed and redeposited, they're very combustible. They're a great fuel source for making fire. The pioneers traveling across the plains knew this. Uh, in an environment with no trees, no coal, Nick Nick meant the difference between life and death. Think about it, they're all roughly the same size, highly compacted grass and other plants, dried and ready to use. Mother Nature is truly incredible. And used even today, this Peruvian boat, in addition to running off coal, regularly burns llama dung. Fill her up now has a, a whole new meaning. Lots and lots of products we as human use are made from poop, such as paper. In fact, products throughout history have been made from poo or have used poo in their refinement. In the 19th century, the tanning process sometimes used poo, including dog poop collected from townsfolk. Uh, it turns out dog feces contains enzymes that break down collagen in hides, part of the tanning process called batting. So going from this to something like this literally was a crappy process. But it didn't stop there. Gunpowder, which fueled warfare beginning as early as the 11th century, requires something called saltpeter. No, not the result of a pigeon pooping. Poop from birds or guano contains high concentrations of saltpeter. And so caves where high numbers of bats produce lots of guano became very important to war efforts. And guarding the poo was not a prize duty for soldiers. But poo is also used in artwork. I'm not sure I want this hanging in my house, but uh, this art is made by Rwandan women using cow dung. The art form is called imigongo in, and it's very popular in Rwanda and can be found nearly everywhere, indoors and out. Poo doesn't always get used quickly. Some poop hangs around for a very, very long time. And that poo is called coprolites. This is a coprolite. It's a piece of fossilized poop and believe it or not is a really common fossil. It looks like this was deposited last week but this poop is actually over 7,000 years old. Art? Nope, ungulate dung. If, you, if you're ever at, uh, looking for fossilized poo, trying to find a place to, to track it down and Let's admit it, who isn't? Uh, Fossil Butte, New Mexico is a great place to look. 
Fossilized poop is almost everywhere in that park. While copper lights are really cool, just a reminder to those in the park who might be looking for them, we don't have copper lights in this park. Um, so if your dog poops, we want you to scoop it up so we don't end up with copper lights in our park. Scat tracking. Poopers and their poop you might find in the park and how to ID it. If you're looking for a new hobby, uh, let me suggest scat tracking. Uh, there's some good guidelines that we're going to help you with. Uh, every animal's poo is different and one of the best ways to tell who pooped in the park is to look at the tracks in the area that you find the poop. And of course, what's in the poop? As the old saying goes, we uh, are all what we eat. Uh, so we're going to look at some of the poop you might find in our park. Raccoons. Prolific poopers, really nasty poop. They love berries of all kinds and you'll frequently find them in raccoon poop. Their poo usually looks like dog poop, so it may be hard to tell. In this case, um, the, the person's dog was probably not in the attic, so I'm pretty sure this is raccoon poop. Insects are also found uh, in raccoon poop because uh, they're a favorite. And uh, some insects leave behind their shells. Think about it. If you, if you eat food with shells, like corn or nuts, what happens to those shells? That's right, they end up in your poop. Other insects, when they're eaten, don't leave much behind. Raccoons frequent the same spots over and over. These spots are called latrines, where old and new poop will be mixed together. Raccoon poop is dangerous, very dangerous. It contains raccoon roundworm. It's a parasite that invades the eyes, the organs, or the brain, and the spinal cord. Kids and dogs are particularly susceptible to it as they're the ones most usually digging around in the dirt. So watch the kids if, uh, if they're going to be looking for raccoon poop. While I haven't heard about uh, canids other than foxes and dogs on San Juan, um, with coyotes and even wolves on the mainland, it's not impossible. We do have foxes in abundance. Uh, coyotes and wolves are both excellent swimmers, so who knows. But likely, if you see canid tracks, they're domesticated dogs or the foxes. Uh, not surprisingly, as a member of the Kenai family, fox tracks look very much like common dog tracks. And their poo uh, looks completely different than dogs, mostly because of what they eat. Rabbits, moles, voles, mice, uh, these are all on a fox's menu and all of them are mammals. That means that they're all covered with hair. And unfortunately, hair doesn't digest very well and ends up in fox poop. And uh, that's one key way to tell if you're looking at fox poop or dog poop. Regardless, feline prints like canine prints are very similar between cat populations. So if you see this print on the island, uh, probably no need to run. Cougars, um, like really fast moving prey. We don't have any of these guys on the island yet. Bobcats. Uh, not that we know of, although one islander has said that they might bring some to the island to help control the deer population. Not sure that's a good idea. Not sure what you think. We'd be interested to know. Cat poo, regardless of the species, looks very similar. Again, wild predators prefer mammals and birds, so cat poo will likely contain fur and feathers. And I haven't heard of a fox eating 45 and a half socks, but at least one dog has. This was extracted from a, a dog's stomach at the veterinarian clinic and um, 
I'm sure that was quite a mess to clean up. And if you don't find socks in the poo, look for scratches, uh, which are most indicative of canids, although felines have this behavior as well. You've probably seen it in your domesticated dog or cat. They like to, to scratch when they're, uh, when they're done. Ungulates such as deer are easy to track and their scat is all over the island. Uh, our ungulates, anyone know what those are? Yep, the Columbia black-tailed deer. Ungulates are split-hooved animals like deer, elk, cows, and many others. Uh, odd, odd fact, if you didn't know it, whales, dolphins, porpoises are all evolved from prehistoric ungulates called artiodactyls. Most of the world's species of large land animals, uh, mammals, are artia, arteriodactyls. Fumit from deer, um, like many ungulates, is deposited as, as small balls. It's partly about moisture retention and evolution. Cows do wet pats rather than pellets because of how they evolved. Cows evolved in lowlands and forest where they have plenty of water, uh, while deer deposit the small balls because they were raised in woodlands and not as much water. So when deer excrete their droppings, they've taken the moisture out of the food, so they have small hard pellets. But it also has to do with the design of the colon. Uh, it's also determined that the rectum and possibly the sphincter have to do with the shape and the size of an animal's poo. Not surprising. We all know this guy or this girl, and hopefully we don't find them in the park, but they're certainly on the island. So let's talk about bowel movements. I know, that was bad. Uh, which one is cow poop? All three, and looking at the poop, we can tell something about the nutrients in the grass and the feed that cows, the particular cow who left these, consumed. This one, too much protein, carbohydrate, and low fiber characterized this cow's diet, and the rate of passage was very high. We call that diarrhea. This manure indicates the cow was eating a poor quality of forage and that uh, it had not enough protein and carbohydrates and it was high in low quality fiber. So the rate of passage is slowed down to the point that excess water has been reabsorbed into the intestines, leaving behind this. And this, happy cow, good diet. So, who was this young lady? Probably didn't know we had these on the islands. Mink poo looks very much like fox poo, except that it's much smaller. If you see it, it'll be similar to cat poo. Uh, where it's found, usually close to water, and the contents of the poop hair, shell, bone, will most likely give it away as mink poo. Although hard to tell from fox poop. River otter poop in latrines, just like raccoons do. Uh, those latrines for, for the river otter act kind of like the World Wide Web for otters. It's a, a communication mechanism, a stinky one, that keeps everybody up to date on their neighbors and allows them to live alone, like most female river otters, or in small groups like most male otters, um, who like being in a larger community. So poo is also a communication tool for some animals. Sea otter poop rises to the surface because they have a really rapid digestion time of less than two hours. Uh, humans' digestion time is about 24 hours. The quick flow through the intestines for the sea otter means that um, undigested shells and air are trapped in the waste so that it floats. 
beavers were wiped out in the San Juans in the 1850s, but they have started showing up in some of the uh, other islands in the wetlands there. If you're looking for beaver scat, look for small cylindrical droppings about two and a half inches long. Uh, most of the, the visible scat is going to be hardened uh, if it's beaver scat. They re-ingest their soft droppings uh, the way the rabbits do. And visible beaver dropping is usually dry since the scat that they leave on the, the water's edge is a hard variety that tends to dry out quickly. If you touch the scat with a stick and try to break it apart, um, it will fall apart like sawdust, not surprisingly. Baby squirrels must be taught to poop. Uh, babies can urinate and defecate only after being stimulated by the mother licking around down there. And squirrels are among species like deer where the mother uses her mouth to carry her offspring's poo and pee away from the nest. This uh, protects them from predators. So there you have some tips on tracking scat in the park, but always remember to be safe. So a little ditty here, because even though it's nice to know about the scats and tracks, just because you like to poop doesn't mean it likes you back. When tracking scat in the woods, always track with ease. It's always best not to touch to prevent scat-borne disease, like these. If you've ever had any of these poop or waterborne diseases, you don't want it again. I have had Giardia from a backpacking trip and it's not a pleasant experience. These are just some of the ones you can get from poo. And these, some of these are not only make you sick, can actually kill you. And these, so we begin to understand why humans have um, attached such negative images to poo, right? Historically, it's been associated with disease and death. However, oddly enough, these are just to name a few. Poo is one of the largest carriers of disease worldwide and causes tens of thousands of deaths worldwide because it's not properly disposed of. So, there you have it. I think you can see that poop, as uncomfortable as the topic is, uh, is one of the most important things on the planet. We all do it. We all need it to create food, and now we know a little bit more about it. Just one more fact. Humans are the only species that use toilet paper, at least for its intended purposes. There you have it. Thanks very much. I hope you learned something about poo. I learned a lot putting this together. Uh, a pretty interesting topic. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Boyd. Great. Thank you, Jeff. That was wonderful. And um, so I'm going to go down to the chat box and I don't see anything there yet. Um, so I'm going to actually ask you a question, Jeff. Um, I often find fox scat in the middle of our driveway, right in the median. Um, any ideas of, is that marking or is it territorial or is it, what is it? Yeah, I, I did read about that and I should have included that, but it's because um, we, we have such prominence of foxes. It is very territorial, yeah. They make it very visible if possible. You'll also note that it, when you're hiking in the park, they like to do it in the middle of the trail uh, for the same reason. They, they mark it where other animals will be traversing. Yep, very territorial. Okay, and I, I One guess of the things I, you and I were talking about earlier, Boyd, which I found fascinating is um, while we have an aversion to, to poop today, it's not a pleasant to uh, topic to talk about, or at least a difficult topic to talk about. There have been times in human history where it's been a curiosity, where 
um, people would actually gather to watch someone else defecate uh, and then critique um, the process or, or the end product. And while we find that incredibly uncomfortable even to talk about, uh, at some points in human history, uh, it was a um, it was a social a, a, a social gathering of a function. I'm not sure it equates to you know to uh, Sunday football, but um, uh, I find that really unusual, odd human behavior. Okay, Jeff, I've got some questions here. Uh, first of all, uh, Lisa Buckton thanks you very much, and. Uh, Hillary LeConte says, "If we find rag, ra sorry, if we find raccoon scat on our property, how should we properly dispose of it?" Well, if you're going to dispose of it, obviously don't touch it with your hands. Um, find some way to scoop it up and get it into a, uh, a container. Uh, you could dispose of it, you know, in the regular trash. I wouldn't worry about that. Certainly wouldn't touch it with with your hands. Um, I, I used to, uh, I've had a couple of small farms and they like barns in particular. So if you have outbuildings and you haven't checked the attics of the outbuildings recently, you might want to do that. They also like under the eaves of, of buildings and houses. So if you haven't checked your roof or around a chimney uh, recently, you might want to do that. Um, and once they begin using a latrine, they will use it for long periods of time and they get very, very nasty, very, very quickly. Uh, so yeah, just be careful how you dispose of it. Don't touch it, get it into some kind of a closed container. Thanks. Um, from Shannon, um, are there flying squirrels uh, on the island? I heard uh, that from someone. I can answer yes, there are. I do uh, not Jeff know White. that, do you know Boyd? Uh, yeah, so there are, I, I've heard of flying squirrels on uh, the north end of the island. I know they're also on orcas, um, but they're nocturnal. So that's one of the reasons you don't actually hear or see them very much. Um, in fact, most of the sightings I've heard about are from people whose cats have brought them in or things like that, uh, but they do exist. And I've never seen their poop. Interesting. So. <laughs> I imagine they're, they're probably treated just like regular squirrels, yeah? Yes. Uh, I'm not seeing any more, so I'm going to ask you another one, if you don't mind. Um, I, on what appear to be deer scat, um, sometimes it's, it's almost like diarrhea. Is that, and not in little, those little pebbles, um, is that a sign that the that the deer is uh, in seriously unhealthy? It could be, or it could be that it's, it's eaten something that it, it's not supposed to. Um, they, they make mistakes just like horses and other animals do. They will, they will eat things from time to time that are not good for them, that are uh, poisonous to them. And uh, if they do that and uh, are going to survive, they have to get that out of their system. So that may, be, that may very well be what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't, um, animals are usually pretty good about knowing what to eat and what not to eat, but on occasion they'll find something that um, they may have never come across before, or it's in a different state than they may have seen it before, and, um, and they'll consume it and it doesn't, doesn't sit with them well. We have the same problem as human beings, by the way. Uh, one more comment. I, uh, we uh, had some owl boxes for a while and I, they were occupied by owls and we used to go empty them out. And of course the, um, the owl scat is just, they're pellets and they're fascinating because if you, with the proper equipment, uh, dissect them, you, you just find literally hundreds of mouse and vole bones. Uh, it, really they're, yeah. it's quite, Clearly that they're voracious eaters and uh, are really a great predator that way. So. Yeah, I, I would add to that. They are incredibly efficient uh, predators as well. They, they are successful more than 80% of the time in, in an attack. They can, of course, they have incredible vision 
and um, are really good, um, uh, have really good vision at night as well. So if anything is moving near an owl, uh, almost any time of the day, it's highly likely that, that they're gonna be successful with it. Uh, they require a lot of calories. They are particularly, Northern spotted owls require a lot of calories. So they, um, they consume a lot of food, have a pretty big, uh, a pretty wide um, habitat uh, for themselves. Um, yeah, so that doesn't surprise me. I haven't, I haven't gone digging in owl poop recently, but I might try that. Yeah. Well, Jeff, I, thank I will you, tell Steve. you if you'll, if you're, if you're interested, if you're interested in what guano looks like, there are bat boxes at English Camp. They're exposed, so um, you'll walk right by them at English Camp. And uh, if please, please stay a, a good distance back. But if you go under those bat boxes. You will see what bat guano looks like, and uh, it's it's pretty atrocious, and quite a bit of it. Well, great. Well, Jeff, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's a, that was a great talk, and uh, as I said at the beginning, we I'm I'm sorry to sorry to see you go for the season, but we'll look forward to next season. So. Absolutely. Looking forward to that, that first one in particular, The Secret Life of Trees. I, I just got done with a book. I'm, I'm going to recommend it. Um, it really turned me on to the topic. It's, it's by a guy named Richard Powers. It's called The Overstory, and it's one of the most magnificent books I've ever written uh, or ever read, so highly recommend The Overstory. And since this is a library program, why not recommend it, right? Yeah, that's right. And we actually have it in the library, so <laughs> you can Great check book. it out. Good. Thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, and we'll see you next season. Okay. Bye-bye.